Hi there! Welcome to Palette University and the next episode of our Paleo Poke series where I take a look at the fossil Pokemon from the perspective of a real paleontologist. If you've never seen any other video in the series, make sure to check out the playlist up in the cards, as well as if you're one of the roughly 40-45% of my viewers who are not subscribed, make sure to click that button uh, down below as well as leave a comment while you're down there to help me outsmart the YouTube algorithm. If you are new to this series, basically what we do is we take a look at the fossil Pokemon and take a look at what extinct animal it might have been based off of, uh, as well as take a look at what moves it learns and uh, its Pokedex entries to try and figure out what type it could have been before the fossilization process added the rock type. And lastly, uh, if you haven't seen the last video in the series where I take a look at Tyrant and Tyrantrum, make sure to check out that video up in the cards as well, as today we'll be talking about the other pair of Generation 6 fossil Pokemon, Amora and Aurorus. Design-wise, these two are definitely my favorite, even though lore-wise, they're much less science-y based than Tyrant and Tyrantrum are. Also, just a quick heads up, their typing is way more straightforward than any other Pokemon we've looked at in this series, so the bulk of the stuff that I'm talking about in this video will be very science-y, which is mostly just an excuse for me to nerd out about a really cool dinosaur. Um, so. Hopefully you like that as much as I do. Amora and Aurorus are almost certainly based off of the diplodocoid sauropod dinosaur, Amargosaurus. Amargosaurus is really iconic for having uh, these really long spines coming out of the vertebrae on its neck, uh, with only one other genus of sauropods uh, having anything like this. And that one is known from basically just like a single skull and a single uh, vertebra. So Amargosaurus is really the only well-established dinosaur that has anything like this. Game Freak choosing Amargosaurus as the inspiration is so cool to me for uh, a couple of reasons. The first one being that just not that many of the fossil Pokemon are based off of a specific, you know, genus of uh, extinct animal. Only three of the nine fossil Pokemon families, you know, pre-Gen 6, are, are based off of a specific genus. The rest are just sort of like a generic thing of whatever group they're supposed to be based off of. And we've had, you know, sauropod inspired Pokemon before, uh, like uh, Meganium and Tropius, whom I also love. They're some of my favorite Pokemon. But, you know, they're very just generic, long neck reptile thing. Whereas Amora and Aurorus are very specifically just weird Amargosaurus things. The really cool thing about them being based off of Amargosaurus is that Amargosaurus is not a well-known dinosaur. Like, if you aren't super into paleontology, there's a decent chance you've never heard of Amargosaurus. And I think one of the reasons for this is that Amargosaurus is relatively recently named. It was discovered in 1991 compared to some of the, the names that you probably have heard of of other sauropods. Most of the really well-known sauropods, you know, were named over a hundred years ago. Like, for example, Brontosaurus, which I could talk at length about because Brontosaurus isn't actually real, but that's a separate conversation. Uh, Brontosaurus was named in uh, 1879. The other sort of most well-known sauropods are probably Brachiosaurus, which was named in 1903, and uh, Diplodocus, which was named in 1878. Compared to these old-timers, Amargosaurus is just a baby. To me, that makes, you know, Amargosaurus being the inspiration so much more cool because hopefully it introduced, you know, a whole new group of people to this really unique and really obscure dinosaur. Since we're talking about Amargosaurus, I want to get into some of the science in its spines, because like I said, it's really the only, with, with an asterisk on that, there's that other species, but that's not, there, there's a lot of things wrong with that species, mostly is that we don't have a lot of fossils of it. Like I said, it's just a single skull and a single vertebra. Whereas with Amargosaurus, we have basically a whole skeleton minus like the front part of the skull. But we definitely have the whole neck, which is super helpful. Anyway, the spines. So since it was discovered about 30 years ago, there's been lots of hypotheses about what these did. Some people propose that there was skin between them and they acted uh, like a sail, like you would think of when you think of like Dimetrodon or Spinosaurus. Um, unfortunately though, they, most people who have proposed that proposed it was just a single sail. Uh, so that's unfortunate for uh, these particular Pokemon. The spines were way too close together. Like, I think I saw one measurement that they were only like three or four inches apart, which just wouldn't make sense to have as a separate sail. But that's still, you know, something that a lot of people uh, sort of hypothesized, especially when it was first discovered. Some people suggested 
that the spines were not connected at all and actually had sort of a sheath of keratin around them uh, like you would think of with the horns of modern basically anything with true horns so think of like your cows your antelope um, basically things that have bone on the inside and then really really hard fingernail material on the outside in that case these spines would probably have been used for uh, defense against predators since even though this was a sauropod it wasn't that big for a sauropod like for example i'm a little over six feet tall i would have been about up to its shoulder uh, maybe a little below its shoulder so in terms of sauropods not all that big so it definitely would have had to defend itself from predators yet some other people have hypothesized that it was actually a big air sac that held air for the lungs which is a lot less outlandish than it sounds many other sauropods actually had this as well uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, so these air sacs are called diverticula and they do hold air for the lungs, but they're also there to like lighten the, uh, the vertebrae because when you're that big, any amount of weight reducing you can do, you do. This hypothesis also sort of includes the, the horn thing because uh, the diverticulum would have only taken up about a third of sort of the height of the spines, whereas the, the top two thirds uh, basically would have been covered in that uh, keratin sheath. These days I think the consensus is that they were used for defense and not a giant air sac, <laughs> but uh, Amagasaurus isn't that well studied, so I could definitely see the consensus sort of shifting to either either continuing with, with the, you know, just for defense, or sort of shifting to the diverticulum hypothesis. There are a couple really interesting sciencey tidbits from Aurorus's Pokedex entries that I wanted to talk about as well before we get into the typing. The entry from Ultra Sun says, An Aurorus was found frozen solid in a glacier just as it appeared long ago, which became a, quite a big event in the news. Which is weird. Number one, we know that these Pokemon lived originally about 100 million years ago, thanks to uh, Amora's Pokedex entries. And from what I can tell, the sort of geologic timeline works basically the same in the Pokemon world as it does in ours. The fact that Aurorus was found in a glacier is weird because up until only about 15 million years ago, there were almost no glaciers on the planet at all. The fact that Aurorus was found in a glacier is weird because up until about 15 million years ago, there were almost no glaciers on the planet at all. That's about when the Antarctic glaciers started forming and uh, you know, the ones in Greenland didn't start forming until about 3 million years ago, and the sort of Ice Age type ones in North America that you think of are like at most 1.5 to 2 million years old. Uh, it was when they just barely started forming, but didn't really reach their maximum until only, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. The only method that I can think of that would make this even make a little sense is if uh, Amora and Aurorus lived in really tall mountains which also have glaciers. However, these glaciers are much, like much, much, much smaller than the glaciers that you see in like Antarctica or Greenland. These glaciers move a lot faster and therefore have just a higher turnover of ice. So things stay frozen in them for shorter periods of time. The only way that Aurorus being found in a glacier makes any kind of sense is if it was found in a massive alpine or mountain glacier like orders of magnitude larger than the largest alpine glaciers today that we see in the Himalayas. Hypothetically possible? Extremely unlikely. Another interesting thing from the Pokedex that basically just tells me that, once again, Game Freak doesn't know that much about science, uh, is Aurora's Pokedex entry from Ultra Moon, which says, This usually quiet and kindly Pokemon has a surface temperature of negative 240 degrees Fahrenheit. For my non-American friends and other scientists, uh, that's roughly negative 150 degrees Celsius. For reference, the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth uh, was down in Antarctica and it was negative 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 89.2 degrees Celsius. Also for reference, Aurorus is apparently slightly colder than the surface of Jupiter. You know, in space. This is literally just not possible for Aurorus because if its surface temperature 
is negative 240 degrees, then the internal temperature would have to be even colder than that. Refrigerators and air conditioners are usually the most energetically expensive appliances that you find in like a normal house. Uh, and that's because it takes a lot of energy to remove heat from things. If this was actually true for Aurorus, it would likely need to eat literally millions of calories per day. And that's not even to mention, I don't know of a mechanism, like a, a biological mechanism, that would even allow for this to happen. Because humans have some of the most efficient, you know, heat reducing uh, adaptations, weirdly. Humans are usually pretty bad at most things, but we're actually very good at keeping ourselves cool. Uh, and that's because we're one of the few animals that sweat. But the thing with sweat is that you can only reduce your temperature down to the air that is removing the sweat from you. So if the external temperature is 90 degrees, you're only going to be able to reduce, you know, your temperature to 90 degrees via, you know, the mechanism that sweat provides. Anyway, with my nerdiness quota for the day done, let's move on to the actual content of this video, uh, the actual typing of Amora and Aurorus. Like I mentioned earlier, this one's very, very straightforward, very, you know, open and shut. Amora's Pokedex entry from Ultra Moon says, Amora was uh, restored successfully, however it's not expected to live long due to the heat in the current environment. This might mean successful in the sense that they were just able to revive it at all, but given the context of Tyrant's Pokedex entry from Ultra Sun, which says uh, its jaw has incredible destructive power, some theories suggest that its current form is different from its form from long ago. It could mean that Amor's Pokedex entry means successful as in correctly. Regardless, it would definitely retain the ice typing, and Aurorus's Pokedex entries frequently mention that it has crystals on its body and in its body, which sounds rock-type to me. Also, technically, ice is a mineral? So I guess technically all ice types are rock-type? Anyway, I feel comfortable leaving Amora and Aurorus as rock ice types. Make sure to let me know your thoughts on all of this sciencey stuff down in the comments below, as well as make sure to keep an eye out for the final episode of this series. You know, it's, we've been doing this for months and months now. The final episode of this series coming out uh, on Saturday, featuring some really cool people from the Common Descent podcast, a popular uh, paleontology-based uh, podcast that I happen to listen to. I did an interview with the host of it, and I'm very, very excited that'll be coming out on Saturday. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at palette underscore you to keep up on all things Pokemon science, as well as if you uh, feel like supporting me in this way, we do have a Patreon as well, where we have Patreon exclusive uh, content. We have uh, a Discord channel that's going to be coming online soon. Um, lots of Patreon exclusive stuff that I think is really cool. And uh, if you feel like supporting me in that way, that link is also down in the description. And as always, there's a time and place for everything.